let me start very softly and start with any, something that you know, that you might have. Actually, this one you don't have because it will, it was just introduced. And uh, actually, my daughter knows how to handle that much better than many other in, others in our family. So if you look at this, this little gadget, this little tool, you might uh, ask yourself, and many physicists do, in fact, what's inside. Yeah, and most of you know, yeah, many of you have Look into this. Well, we in Innsbruck are not experts on this kind of uh, physics and uh, certainly are the, the, the making of these devices. But uh, I'm sure most of you know uh, a lot about it. And in particular, you know that um, the technology is driven by the fact that system size becomes ever smaller and smaller. And uh, this is an example of the newest the Intel technology with 22 nanometers distances between conductors. And um, well, I mean, for sure. and You've seen all that. The, the, the field is, is driven by this development. And uh, this is um, shown in this plot. This is basically Moore's law. I'm sure many of you have seen that before. Uh, for those of you who have, have not, this is time down here, the years over the last uh, 50 years. And this is the numbers of uh, transistors per, um, per little element. Yeah? That this is one of these uh, machines. Yeah? And, and now you can see, well, there's uh, been a huge increase. Actually, this is a logarithmic scale. And in fact, it means that every two years, effectively, the numbers of transistors on one of these chips has been doubling. And uh, in fact, there's a little bit more information. It's not, not just uh, the chips that do the computation, but also the storage chips here. And actually, we are up here now. And uh, if you look at this development, that's actually quite, quite tremendous. Yeah? And the question is, where will this lead? Where will this go? And uh, you can view this in a little different way. Uh, you can look, again, time here, and now the size of the conductors, as I showed you earlier. So now we are down to here at this time now, 22 nanometers becomes, is, is becoming commercially available. And uh, the next technology step uh, by the roadmap uh, of, of the, the, the semiconductor industry will be the 16 nanometer technology. And if you think about that, what does that mean, 16 nanometers? Well, that's only 30 sil silicon uh, atoms across, yeah? So this is not a whole lot, yeah? I mean, still 30, yeah? OK, but what's the ultimate limit? And the ultimate limit is this, yeah? And uh, this is uh, taken from uh, um, a scientific American, uh, American group. Uh, in fact, that, uh, and actually the various groups, I'm just, that's why I'm not listing uh, anything here. Many groups are now working with wires that are really uh, consist of a single or perhaps two atoms. Actually, from this picture, it's not quite clear whether this double structure here is some tip artifact from the scanning microscope. Anyways, what you see here, for, the, for those of you who've never seen that before, you really see a row of atoms. You don't see the individual atoms really, but you see that this is a row of atoms. And um, I mean, that's the ultimate limit, you would say, yeah? unless somebody of you invents new physics. Yeah? So, uh, so that's OK. But we are not too far away. Yeah? We just talked about 30. This is one. And uh, let me simplify that. Physicists like to simplify things. So this would be our row of atoms. And this is uh, uh, our electron that passes along. And uh, the big question now is, what happens? Yeah. So in fact, uh, for, for later in the talk, I will need that this actually this, these atoms, you see, because they sort of are little uh, hills and mountains here in the way. They are little like a little potential, a periodic potential along which the electron travels. In fact, it's not a single electron. I mean, by now, it's still as many electrons. Uh, what, what really matters is, in fact, that it's many electrons. Yeah, not three dozens, perhaps. But in, at the end, yeah, well, it will be only one, perhaps. And so the first fundamental question I would want to ask is, how does transport happen in such a context when, in particular, the dimensions of the systems are confined? So this is not a 3D world anymore. This is a 1D world for these particles. Yeah? The electrons move in, in, a, in a certain sense, which I will not tell you today what I really mean by 1D. But you see, obviously, this world is 1D. Now, let's not just talk about conductors, but also talk about the switching elements that you need to do the computation. Yeah? Somebody in your, some, something in your, in, your, in your cell phone, in your computer, has to do the logical gates. Yeah? And so how does the hardware look like? And let me just remind you of the developments uh, the first transistor here, a uh, huge chunk uh, 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 in, from the four, uh, 40s. And I'm sure you know the Nobel Prize was given to that. And um, uh, nowadays, technology looks like that. So you see the circuit uh, paths here and uh, various uh, other components here in, on this uh, um, integrated circuit. 
And uh, if, if I just zoom in one of these, you see a typical a transistor where you have the so-called gate, the source and the drain. And for the non-experts, uh, uh, well, basically this gate uh, says whether a current can flow from here to there. Yeah? And you see the size, we are down to uh, 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 40 uh, uh, nanometers, yeah? which is 14, 40 billionth of a, of a meter. Yeah? So that's quite, quite a, a small sizes already. Now, the, now the question is, uh, what about single, swi single particle switching? And in fact, that's a very active part of research right now. So now I'm talking about how could you switch a single electron? Yeah? And uh, this is taken from PTB uh, website, where there's a transistor that basically works on a single electron on these electrodes. You see, the electrodes are still, they contain, contain still a lot of atoms here. Yeah? If you take the distance across, these are still a, a few hundred atoms. But it's the, it's the electrons, the single electron being used in these devices now. And in fact, if here from, taken from the ETH Zurich, um, there is a sort of, a, a, this is called a qu coupled quantum dot. An electron uh, comes from here to there. It has to go around this mountain, either this way or that way. Yeah? It's really single electrons, and I'm not showing you the data of that group, that have to pass through these devices. They have to decide whether they go left and right. In fact, quantum mechanics tells us that they will then show interference. And, but that already shows us that we are at this level now of single particles. Yeah? We're doing this in the lab. When I say we, the physics community. Yeah? So we are investigating these things. Now, um, now, the next question is, now I talked about the current, the, 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 the carriers of the information, but could also the pieces that do that be single atoms? And in fact, yes, there are results now from after 2000 from various groups where one now builds uh, devices where a single atom does the switching, yeah, or is supposed to do the switching. Yeah? And here, this example for uh, here, you see these atoms lined up. There's a single atom on the surface, so this is a schematic sketch. This is one electrode, this is another electrode. The gate electrodes are somewhere below here. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and, and, and whether you apply uh, uh, some air, a voltage to that particle here, which is, uh, I believe, a phosphor, a phosphor atom, and here's a cobalt atom, a phosphor atom decides whether a current can flow to this de uh, device. Again, this device is now single particles that do the switching, but the particles are many particles. So the ultimate limit is, well, certainly a single atom switching single or single electron or electron on an atom switching a single electron. That's the ultimate limit. And my guess is we'll get, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah? And the, the community, many different people are doing this. And in fact, I'll be talking about this to some extent today. So now the idea is you have an atom here in some state. Yeah? Uh, and uh, certainly all the quantum physicists here will immediately think about some quantum state. And, but nevertheless, you could view this as a switch on and off. So either the electron passes or the electron uh, uh, does not pass. Yeah? And in the quantum world, I mean, this would be the classical world. In the quantum world, as you know, um, um, this can be a superposition. So the electron can be, uh, or the, at the switch here, the switching particle here, whatever that is, this is an atom here in this case, can be in a superposition of these two states, can be on and off at the same time in a certain sense, in a quantum mechanical sense. And that means that also this current can be in, in this uh, superposition. In the quantum physicists would say, well, it's in fact in an entangled state, and this written this way. Yeah? So when, this, when the state is on, the current, uh, the state is one, let's say, the current is on, and when the state is um, two, the current is off. So, but I'm just putting this very simple example and certainly oversimplifies to show where we will be heading. Yeah? And as you know, many people are working from various different directions on this, on this very interesting field. Now, after this introduction, what are the questions? Yeah? I mean, this list is very long. Yeah? So let me just uh, highlight a few things. So how does quantum transport really happen? It turns out, and I haven't told you that in detail, uh, the world is completely different in 1D. Yeah? It's simply not... Uh, a Fermi liquid anymore for electrons, it's completely different. So, in fact, if you look at, a, at the typical pure 1D systems and you introduce a little bit of interactions, yeah, or not, depends on what system you, do, you look at, but usually you don't have transport, interestingly. Yeah? So when do you get transport? Yeah? And uh, do you need to break that transport, uh, that, that in particular the coherence in some way, to get reasonable transport in such systems for electrons, for example? So, uh, so what, uh, the question now is, uh, what do the, the dimensions do on this system? So now the next question is, can a single particle switch an entire system? Yeah, this is interesting, certainly, because in the end, now we are doing this with many electrons, man switching many electrons, but in the end, it will be single electrons switching a few or just a single one. 
so then a very important uh, question is the role of interactions. With electrons, as you all know, the system is very complicated in the sense that well, electrons alone are simple. They just obey Coulombs, the laws of Coulomb. Yeah? <laughs> but it, this, the, the interaction is screened in a solid state system. So it turns out it's actually very difficult to get a real understanding of the interactions in such a system. And in fact, most of the solid state physics people just do approximate models. Now, so what is then the role? The next question is, now I talked about transversal confinement. What is the role of the longitudinal confinement? So I told you that the, the, the electron has to run along these little hills. Yeah? So what does that do? Yeah? And uh, uh, all solid state people know about this block wave function and so on. Now, uh, then what are, what are impurities doing and defects? In fact, they are probably very important for the typical way we do computation nowadays. So that's connected with the question, what is dissipation doing in these systems? Yeah, as you know, uh, these systems, um, if I just have touched my cell phone, it's warm, yeah? So it's dissipating energy, yeah, and quite a lot. And it, that needs to, be, it needs to go down if one wants to continue. Um, so then there, there are very uh, questions that actually we are interested in. Are there new quantum states of matter that, that have interesting properties that one can use for computational pro uh, purposes? and all the quantum computing people actually will now find themselves in these last two points. Can one, with these techniques, in the end build a quantum computer or a simulator, yeah, or quantum simulator, whatever that is in detail. But I come to one or the other points later. Now, so what do we want? Yeah? We need full quantum control at the single and many particle level. We really want this yeah, in the end. Yeah? So now, nowadays, I mean, we're approaching this from various directions, uh, and in particular in the context of the real systems that we have in our cell phones, certainly we are by far away from these, this kind of control. We really want quantum control, and I will highlight that in a moment. I will tell you what that means. So we in Innsbruck, not, not just me, but uh, um, the whole group, quantum gas group, has toy, a toy system for that, yeah? So a model system, and I will want to tell you how we can use this. In fact, this was motivated by work done in the theory department here in Innsbruck, so it's, an, it's basically what we do is we have an optical lattice, like egg cartons, and our atoms are little eggs in this egg carton. Yeah? So individual atoms that we load into that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that this potential landscape. And uh, uh, admittedly, the size between these, these, these potential wells, the, 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 the troughs here, is quite large. It's a half a micron. But that doesn't matter for this kind of toy model. We just want to, and I will show you in a moment, want to uh, uh, in, uh, investigate interesting effects. So um, in particular, what happens, and I will walk you through that also a little later, is that, uh, that the, these particles can arrange in a very ordered way. We call this a mod insulator state. This proposal, as I said, came from the Zoller group many years ago. And uh, we are interested in these systems, for the reasons that you will see in a moment, as, as sort of as a preparatory stage for what we want to then investigate. So now, um, I should say we are not the only ones. The, like the uh, large part of the cold atom community, the cold gases community to which we belong, is interested in that. And I'll just show one example where, in fact, such an ordered array of atoms can be investigated with a high resolution lens. And these dots that you see here are actually individual atoms spaced by about half a micron apart. Uh, uh, so these are really pictures on individual atoms. So one can in investigate these systems and principles. So that's why I like, uh, like to use these comics. So now, let me give you one example. One example could be a one-dimensional array of particles that is switched by another nearby particle. Yeah? So that looks pretty much like what I discussed before. Yeah? So that's sort of the goal, uh, the, the far-reaching goal for us now to, to, uh, to achieve in the lab, that we switch, let's say, this few-body or many-body system by, let's say, a single, single particle. And uh, let me just introduce the terms. We call this a quantum wire. And, um, uh, and uh, and uh, if this atom here uh, interferes with this transport, we would call this blockade. And this is the simplest example. And now you could start with thinking, making this much more complicated, and so on and so on. But if you can do that, you can do a lot. Now, so what, what do we need for this? We want to achieve full control over, and I mean quantum control for the experts, of the motion of the particles, yeah, how they move in, in that kind of lattice. And we want to... Uh, uh, um, have switchable and sizable interactions between the particles. Because without interactions, the system wouldn't work. Yeah? We really need the interactions to do the blockade, let's say. And we need to be able to s really switch these interactions on and off. Turns out that for electrons, it's very hard, usually. Yeah? Electrons simply, they have, um, I mean, you have to do this in a very indirect way. But for electrons, they simply have this charge, and you don't get rid of it. Yeah? 
But uh, there are other systems uh, which are at least for the toy models that I want to discuss that are much better than electrons. And why not use electrons for all that? Oh, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we don't want to use electrons, yeah? Um, first of all, electrons, well, they have their charge and they are very susceptible to any electric fields. So doing these experiments with electrons is very hard. And you might know uh, people are doing experiments with single electrons, but they're only doing spectroscopy. They're not really doing this kind of quantum control stuff that I want to talk about here. Now, we want to talk about the motion, and let me just back up. And this is, again, some of you can now go to rest for a little second. Let me just uh, remind you how we achieve control. And this is a temperature scale. Um, we are here. Outer space is here at 3 Kelvin. The solid, uh, and if you have a good fridge, you get down to this temperature. And this is the regime that we are interested in. It's the regime of laser cooling and Bose-Einstein condensation. What does that mean? Bose-Einstein condensation, if you take particles, and they are still very hot, they move about. In fact, particles are waves, and, in f and, and they are probability waves, and these waves can interfere, they can have a long wavelength, and what happens in the end, if you cool down, they all find themselves under suitable conditions, they find themselves in a macroscopic wave, and we call this a Bose-Einstein condensate. And in fact, we have in, in Innsbruck now seven machines, I believe, that uh, produce a Bose-Einstein condensate every 15, minute, uh, 15 seconds or so. Yeah, so we do this routinely in the lab, this cooling process, we call this a Bose-Einstein condensate BC or microscopic matter wave. So in the experiment, it looks like this. We cool the particles, uh, typically by evaporative cooling. This is a momentum distribution. You see a condensation peak here. Um, this is certainly the example of bosons. If you have fermions, the system is a little bit more difficult. So if fermions want to condense, they have to pair up, and things like that have to happen. Um, but um, what we are interested in, and that's just what I want to focus on today, uh, we want to have perfect ordering, in some sense, zero entropy. Well, my wife won't believe that, that I'm talking about this, yeah? You can ask her, where is she? <laughs> so she, what, she thinks that th this is impossible for a physicist, yeah? But, uh, well, <laughs> probably only because we try to do this in the lab, yeah? At home, then, we uh, say, no, 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 this is actually impossible to get a zero entropy house, yeah? So the temperature here is 10 nanokelvin for these systems, and as you all know, for these uh, breakthroughs many years ago, now 15 years ago, the Nobel Prize was given a little later then. Now, what do we do? Now we take this matter wave and we load it into these potentials that are already introduced, yeah? These, uh, these corrugations, let, let me call them this way, these periodic corrugations. And we load them in very gently, and what happens, interestingly, and that was uh, first recognized by Peter Zoller uh, uh, here in Innsbruck, uh, that in fact uh, the particles in this wave, they have to decide where they are. So they localize down here. Yeah? Let me just uh, tell you that this we, how we call this. We call this a mod insulator state. And uh, it's a phase transition yeah? from being a superfluid to being uh, 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 this kind of insulating state. It turns out it's an insulator. Yeah? Before, here it's superfluid and now it's insulating. Now, I won't, don't want to walk you through all the properties of that system. In fact, there's an ever-growing gro number of groups working on these, uh, the properties of these systems. Uh, uh, BECs and that phase transition. Let me just give you one example that uh, is of interest today. It turns out if you uh, start with the right density or with the right chemical potential, you, uh, or you have an ordering that you have precisely one particle per site, in this case one atom. Yeah? Or if you start with a different initial uh, uh, density, particle density, you would have exactly two particles uh, in, uh, uh, setting here in, in, in your site, in your wells of this, of this so-called optical lattice. Yeah. We call this a two-atom mod shell. And why is this not completely homogeneous here? Well, because we always have some slow trapping, slow gentle trapping on top of that. Now, but this is very interesting because you can see now we can prepare these systems with precisely one quantum particle or two or three or so at each <coughs> site. Now, I should mention one thing. One, uh, what it actually means, these particles not just sit there, but they are really localized in the sense that they sit in the lowest quantum state. Yeah? So they really sit in these low in the lowest band here so these are the vibrational states and this is the lowest band and they really sit down here and what in fact is interesting is now we have we would have to zoom in here and I will not do that today uh, that in fact these two particles now they interact and they actually see a sizable energy shift due to interactions yeah and that energy shift is different when there are two or three or four particles at each side that can be used for blockade effects now now I've to told you about the motion control let me uh, review briefly what interactions we have, yeah? since we are not using electrons. We have two types in the experiments. We have what we call contact interactions. This is short-ranged, yeah? has a very strong fall-off. Uh, it can be tuned. It can be tuned by so-called Feschbach resonances. 
So the scattering parameter, which we call the scattering length, can be tuned as a function of, an, let's say, an external magnetic field. We'll not talk about this today at all. Just want to say we can play with these interactions. We can modify them. Um, and it's, uh, the nice thing is it's usually available for all atoms and molecules. So these interactions are there, and one can play with them to some extent. And there's another type of interactions that, in fact, we are now interested now in now is uh, long-range interactions. Slow fall-off, turns out it has an angle dependence. It's also tunable and switchable by means of, in this case, of an uh, electric field. So what I'm talking about is dipole-dipole interaction between electrical dipoles. Yeah? And it, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, induced by an e external electric field. And in this sense, it can be switched on and off. Yeah? And or you switch from one state that has this property to another, and then you can switch. And it's, it, it, it comes in two flavors. It can, comes for either magnetic dipoles or for electric dipoles. Yeah? So it's fairly strong for electric dipoles and comparatively weak for magnetic dipoles. Yeah? But it, I think it can, will be, will be, the community will be using these two types of interactions in the, uh, in the near future uh, to a very large extent. Now, I should flash at least some Hamiltonian yeah, for uh, for the physicists now, yeah, so, um, uh, but I should do this because I really want to explain what we mean by motion on a lattice and the extension of what I want to be talking about today. So this kind of Hamiltonian describes the motion on a lattice. Most of you have seen that. This means that particles can uh, hop from one side to the other. So we are destroying a particle on the J side and the, uh, 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 creating a particle on the I side. So this is nothing else but a tunneling process. We have interactions on site. This is the energy payoff that I just talked about already. This energy is shifted when particles sit on top of each other. And this is usually what we have when we have contact interactions, as I just said. The particles have to sit on top of each other, and they don't have that when they sit next to each other, on the ne let's say, nearest neighbor site here. But what's really interesting, and that brings me back to my beginning, yeah, where we want to switch this row of atoms. Well. Uh, we need this part where we really have a long-range interaction from one side to the other, across typically half a micron. Yeah? So this is uh, given by this uh, U1, this, which says uh, that this is the, dipole -dipole, the strength of the dipole-dipole interaction. And I have omitted the, uh, the angle dependence of that interaction yeah? for simplicity. Now, we can come back. And you could say, well, OK, we now have all the ingredients. We could have a row of these dipoles, and you have one sitting here. And it precisely switches this one, but it's already too far away to switch the other ones. So this could sort of be a sort of, uh, if you wish, uh, 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 a Coulomb of, or rydberg boclet It's always the same. Yeah? You block uh, nearby lying particles. Yeah? And you, we really want this long-range interactions. Yeah? And, and the interesting thing is that this happens in a quantum state dependent way. Yeah? So bear with me for a moment. So what have we done so far in Innsbruck? And uh, perhaps I should just be very brief on that. Yeah, I mean, we've done a, a lot in this field already. But uh, I think we are just at the start, yeah. I mean, I'm just starting my professorship today. So we are at the start, yeah. So I should not talk about too much about the past. So um, uh, what have we done? And uh, so we have looked at transport, yeah. Just, flash, just flashing our transport uh, uh, publications here. So we've looked, for example, at how transport is inhibited in a lattice. So this is, in fact, the rule, yeah, if you have a clean system. There is no transport. This, the, actually, if you think about electrons in a lattice, they are always Bragg reflected. Yeah? So if you had a perfect lattice, nothing would happen. Luckily, the world is different. Yeah? Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't, I guess we wouldn't be standing here. Um, now, uh, we could, you could then say, well, if you have this inhibited transport, can we force it? And well, certainly you can force it by inducing dirt to the system. Yeah, OK, yeah. Well, we want to do this in a coherent way. And actually, you can do that. And we're just listing one of the works. And many other groups have, uh, have started working on this. Now, um, an interesting issue is what happens if the dimensionality is confined. I told you that already. The systems are 1D at some point. Yeah, they will be 1D, either 2D or 1D. So, uh, and in fact, uh, particles behave in a different way. Interacting particles behave in a completely different way when they start to see the confinement. Yeah. And we have been looking now at another effect where, in fact, we again, transport is in some sense inhibited, quenched, uh, when uh, we have many particles and they see this lattice. Yeah. And without walking through all that, let me just highlight this one last thing. What, what is this about? Think about a 1D system. And if you think about a superfluid system that I introduced at the beginning, it looks like this. Yeah? The wave function sort of is smeared out. Yeah? Now, this happens. This is the case if the interactions are weak. Yeah? Now, if the interactions are strong between the particles and the system is still 1D, 
the particles sort of they cannot classically speaking they cannot avoid each other yeah they cannot go around and the wave function actually the correlation function strictly speaking looks like this yeah these particles become correlated for the experts the density is always flat it's just the, that's the way the correlation function looks like so if you know where one particle is then you know where the other one is yeah so the system is correlated and that actually is the field of strongly correlated systems and in the 1D system we uh, induce that by increasing interactions now what happens now if you introduce a lattice? And before I already told you what happens um, if you raise a lattice and you uh, uh, raise it sufficiently high uh, for weakly interacting particles, in this case bosons, the, the, the particles will be localized and they will go into this mod insulator state, this insulating state. Yeah? And this is almost, it, it, it almost I mean, it's almost a, a, a trivial kind of phase transition. Yeah? You would expect that almost classically, I would say, that this happens. Now it turns out if, um, if the system already has this kind of correlation, if it's already strongly interacting, and if one is really in 1D now, very interesting effects hap uh, effect happens, namely the following, and this is, has been well known in the theory li literature, what happens is that um, the lattice can be arbitrarily weak, as weak as you wish, and the particles are already localized. The reason is that you already have this kind of uh, 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 self-localization in some sense. Yeah. It's, it's a bad word to say localized. It's not localized, yeah, but it's correlated, yeah. So a, an arbitrarily weak lattice will induce such a, um, uh, uh, such a localization. And this is captured by a quantum field theory that I will not introduce here. Just want to show you the phase diagram. Let me briefly walk you through that. This shows two phases, the superfluid and the mod phase that are basically already introduced to you. Um, this shows interactions at the bottom here. And in fact, I, I'm using inverse interactions, so interactions increase to the left. Yeah? And this is the depth of the lattice in suitable units. And so what now happens is that you have a phase boundary between this insulating state and that superfluid state. If you look at that, you, would f you find this very surprising feature that this phase boundary here does not go down to zero, zero here. But it goes down to a finite value, a critical interaction parameter. It turns out it's very finite, yeah? very reasonable. I've, I won't introduce to you this, what this is. This is a dimensionless number here. Um, and the, the point, though, is that what you see, ha what happens is that here, beyond a certain strength of interactions, uh, we immediately have this modern insulator. Yeah? That's what I said, with the lattice can be ar arbitrarily weak. And this regime is called the regime of immediate pinning. And we've me done measurements on that, and I will not walk you through that. We've actually, and this is the same plot as before, we've put data points into this diagram to, sh uh, to map out in with various techniques the, the phase boundary between um, uh, these two uh, parts, uh, just for the experts. In the upper part, this phase boundary is, uh, uh, is, is, is captured by the so-called Bose-Hubbard model. In the bottom part, it's captured by this Sine-Gordon field theory. So now, this is what we have done. And again, this is the regime of immediate pinning. So what does that mean? Well, in a pure 1D system with sufficiently strong interaction for bosons, and just let me remind you, uh, Cooper pairs are bosons, yeah? There's no interaction. So you would say, is this good or is this bad? Well, for sure it's cool, yeah. <laughs> and in particular, you can now ask questions, what, can, what else can introduce this, yeah? Uh, this kind of localization, yeah? And in particular, a single particle could probably do this. And actually noise can do that in some extent, the random potential can do that, and so on. Actually, there's a vast literature on uh, treating just that problem. Okay, what else have we done? Now let me switch to the interaction part. And, uh, uh, remind you, well, this, uh, these long-range interactions between dipoles, magnetic dipoles, uh, that's very interesting, yeah, so I'm uh, showing here two atoms that have a certain distance at a certain angle, and the strength is characterized by some constant, which is basically the square of the, of the uh, 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 dipole moment of these particles, yeah, with the magnetic uh, constant here in front. And there are very interesting experiments uh, along these lines, I should mention in particular Innsbruck here, uh, my colleague uh, Francesca Ferlaino. Um, and, um, uh, but uh, what I will focus on now is the polar case. Polar means polar molecule case, the case of uh, electric dipole-dipole interaction. So this would be the electric dipole moment here. Uh, here is the permittivity constant. And the typical particles you would have to use now is not atoms, because atoms don't have a dipole moment, electric dipole moment in the ground state. It's very, very weak. Yeah? It is, uh, you have to go do, do something that sort of has, has sort of a dipole. Uh, and it has to be some molecule where you have an even, uneven weight on, on how, the, how the electronic wave function is distributed ab across that particle. So it has to be, in the simplest case, a two-atom molecule, and in fact, uh, these are typically candidates. Yeah. 
Now, uh, let me just uh, show you how strong this interaction is. So this is a, um, sort of the, the dipole moment for these systems, yeah, uh, or, uh, in, uh, or for, the, for, the, um, uh, for the magnetic in the, in the right unit, sort of, yeah, translated into that. Uh, and here is the radius, the length scale given by this constant that I just introduced. Uh, and you see, uh, well, typical atoms are down here. It turns out that's negligible. Magnetic par particles are here and molecules are up here. So this, from here to here, it's about, uh, it's actually a factor of alpha squared, fine one over alpha squared, fine structure squared, because the magnetic field is accordingly weaker than the electric field. So to make a long story short, we are interested in electric dipoles, yeah, here now. So what's the specific case? The specific case is through medium cesium. Now, uh, let me show you how this works. Now you have to uh, bear with me a little bit. Um, so a quantum physicist, and even if he wants to do solid state uh, switching a device at some point, has to go into the nitty gritty details of molecular spectroscopy, which turns out to be a lot of fun. But uh, well, we have to learn it at least a little bit. And the situation is follow the following here. This is the state we start with. Will not say much about it. This is the final state. What I just want to show you about these two states, and they are connected by two lasers. Let me just simplify it, yeah? Two states, and, it, and uh, 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 the initial state, which we call, which I for now just call off state, and the on state. Why I call, call this on and off? Well, we couple them with two lasers, and down here in this state, this dipole moment is on. Now, these particles, they, they see each other, yeah? They interact. If, when they are in this other state, which I ju just call the off state now, uh, without telling you how we prepare that and so on in detail, um, uh, the system is simply off. Yeah? So in principle, with two lasers, we can switch from a system that is non-interacting um, on this long scale, long distance scale, to a system that is interacting. Okay, now um, we have done experiments yeah, uh, in our group on this, and uh, let me just walk you through that because it's not so difficult. This is in fact, so take these two lasers and what we basically do, we connect the state off to the state on. So uh, this is the lasers down here and in fact we switch between the one state and the other state here. Yeah? Uh, the on state is, 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 is this one here, uh, sorry this one here when we, are, we don't have a signal in our experiment. We have a signal when we are off and back and when we come back in fact we have again this, uh, uh, the, we have switched this interaction off. Yeah? So we haven't seen that interaction, this experiment I should mention. But we can play with it. Yeah, we can now, actually our switch is a little pretty bad switch. You see, it's so far only 90, roughly 90%, 90%, uh, but nevertheless, not too bad. Yeah. Okay, now um, how, how would we do this in the experiment? Yeah. Um, how would we control such a system? Now I have all the ingredients and I've summarized it here. The ingredients are the following. We take our superfluid systems that I introduced earlier. In this case, we will have to take two. Yeah, because we want to end up with rubidium and cesium. We put them into a lattice and we mix them in such a way that again we produce two particles at a side. And now we use this trick that I mentioned to you earlier as a preparation trick. Yeah, two particles localized at each side. Um, in fact, my students are learning how to do this right now. Um, then we go into, um, then actually we, so, sorry, first we take these two atoms and we turn them into the off state that we now call off state into for the chemist, a weakly bound molecule. Yeah. And then we go to the ground state where the system has a dipole moment and where it so, so, uh, shows interaction. Yeah. There's been a lot of uh, Innsbruck work uh, along this. Also my colleagues, Rudi Grimm and Johannes hecker denschlag did here uh, the pioneering work first. Now, so we call this uh, a transfer to the row vibranic ground state here to, to, in, uh, to induce that switch. Okay. So now I've introduced you uh, where we are, now where are we headed? <coughs> so now th I think there's a vast, many things open. Yeah, and I'm always very impatient, my students and postdocs know, let's do it, yeah? Um, there's so much to do and the list is uh, becoming ever longer because there are many nice techniques that other groups have invented and that we also want to use. So one can do now a lot of interesting things. One can do uh, many body physics with these systems, yeah, and I'll give you an example in a moment. We can do the things that I just introduced to you earlier. We can do these uh, 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 sort of information pur purposes, yeah? and in particular in the context of quantum information um, that connects to this quantum transport point here. We can look uh, at systems that are not in equilibrium. I basically so far only talked about the ground states, the stationary states. Uh, most, many of my theory colleagues are actually interested in 
in the systems that show dynamics that they actually cannot calculate. Yeah? They can calculate the ground states, but they have a problem then calculating the dynamics. And then there are other applications uh, that are basically, um, uh, uh, in, in our case, uh, case, almost upfile product, I should almost say it, yeah? because we immediately do high precision spectroscopy on these systems, and we can look at very interesting ultra cold chemistry. Now, I will not go into the details. Let me just walk you through some of the examples. And one is, the, uh, is this one of um, the, the, um, this Hamiltonian that I showed you earlier with the long range interactions. Yeah? And uh, our friends in Innsbruck and Harvard have calculated the phase diagram for that. Uh, so what is this? What is a phase diagram? Phase diagram is sort of it says when is the system solid and when is it fluid or liquid? Yeah, everybody basically knows this. Yeah, uh, all, I mean I'm now addressing the non-physicists here in the audience. Yeah, in this case we are plotting uh, uh, a phase diagram where we so it's a sort of some way selected phase diagram where we plot uh, sort of the particle number or chemical potential in the vertical direction and um, and the, uh, uh, how much we allow the particles to be mobile here by the, this tunneling rate. So what does that mean? Yeah? And I should show you what it means, uh, very pictorial picture, uh, pictures. Yeah? It shows if you have the right filling of particles, you get, for example, as the ground state, such, such a checkerboard pattern. So your atoms sit on this lattice, but they have, because of the dipole interaction, now they have to start avoiding each other. So this would one of the, be one of the, I would say, almost trivial ground states. Yeah? But it would be, nobody has seen that so far. Yeah? We would like to see that, that you have a phase transition to that state. Yeah? Um, now, I, but I need that state in a moment. And then the other states here, actually in this region, in this region, yeah, uh, which have uh, 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 some uh, sort of where the particles have to avoid uh, each, each other even more yeah, at lower fillings. Um, so I should say, these, are these error bars here, they come from so-called quantum Monte Carlo calculations. Are, so these calculations, these Theorists, they do, they do experiments on their computer, yeah, and that's why they have error bars. So this is all theory. Now, uh, why am I showing you this? Well, there is some region here, the green one, that turns out to be the interesting one. Yeah. It's SS, it stands for solid state, super solid, yeah. and super solid means that the system between this solid phase and the superfluid phase, it's at the same time solid and superfluid. Yeah. So it, it doesn't really know what to do. Yeah. And interestingly, you would say, why doesn't that, that occur in the, in, the, in the earlier case for atoms? Well, for atoms, there is really a boundary directly from the solid to the superfluid. Here, there is an in-between phase because of that long-range interactions. So one particle that moves has to push the other particle. And so you do have a lattice moving around in a superfluid way. So you would say, what the heck? But it turns out, theory colleagues say, this is one of the holy grails of solid-state physics. We would like to see this. Yeah. Does this exist? Does this, I mean, quantum theory says it should. Does it exist? Here, our friends say it should exist, and let's see if we can see it in the experiments. And this was, in fact, calculated for the specific case of the molecules that we are have in ha at hand. Let me give you another example um, where I remove the lattice. Yeah, I can add it again later on. Yeah. But now let's take, we take two planes of, of particles. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, 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 one plane in the other, the spacing is such as before, about half a micron. And now these, these dipoles, they can actually talk from one plane to the other. Turns out this is a very rich system. Yeah? And I've not listed all the publications from various groups, particular Innsbruck, Harvard, Paris, and so on, uh, have now looked at this over the last 10 years. And uh, let me just mention the highlights that people have, um, have, have come up with. One, one highlight would be that, in fact, this system uh, could model uh, high temperature superconductivity. Yeah? Because we know high temperature su superconductivity has to, has, ha has to have a relation with uh, the fact that the system is 2D, it's confined. Yeah? These uh, coup rates have this kind of property. And this could be a system now with fermions, these dipoles now are fermions, to uh, investigate, uh, to again produce a toy model. And then you can add a lattice on top and so on. And the next, uh, actually, what uh, I think fi I find very interesting is if you now imagine you have a couple more layers, that these dipoles actually b start to sort of uh, 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 behave like filaments. And they are then not like what we know from many uh, polymers and so on. They are not classical polymers or filaments. They are quantum filaments. They can have, have all kinds of interesting properties. Yeah? So I think this is enough motivation to study that system. So let me perhaps come back to the initial part that, I've, uh, that I talked about. Yeah? 
So a simple system would be the following. Le let's again prepare this one, uh, 1D quantum wire and uh, add an impurity here. And uh, already that system, my theory friends tell us, or tell us, well, this is very interesting because they can't treat it anymore with the usual techniques for the experts with Luttinger liquid theory, for example. It's, for ex it's completely new. They have a huge problem calculating the properties of a single particle in such a, in such a 1D system. And in fact, I'll be moving to a conference and, and th th this weekend where uh, people, uh, a lot of people will, will merge that are just interested in that problem. Turns out that the diffusion of the system yeah, is, uh, it behaves in a funny way, in a subdiffusive way. And theory says this should happen. And in fact, people have developed some theory to, 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 see th to, 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 to analyze that. Experiments have not seen that yet. And many other effects could happen, in fact, in this system that I will not mention. The last thing I want to mention is now let's uh, go away from the single particles, perhaps take a few more, and uh, arrange a system that looks like this. Again, sort of checkerboard pattern, yeah? And uh, uh, for all the ones uh, who, of you who are familiar with magnetism, they would immediately say, well, heck, this is magnetism, yeah? Uh, because now you can, uh, one particle or the other can actually give them a pseudo spin, and that could be a sort of a magnetic system, yeah? And you can investigate a lot of uh, 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 the properties that one would expect from a uh, magnetic system in a very controlled way. Now, um, I should say, all this is possible in Innsbruck, that we can head towards these directions, and I've just highlighted a few things, because we have a very nice environment. In fact, uh, the eintrapping group has these single atoms, basically single spins on a row here, and uh, uh, they are not so much interested directly in the transport properties of these systems, yeah, but they are interested in how the spin information goes from one particle to the next, basically, broadly speaking. Yeah? So that can be used for quantum information and quantum simulation purposes. And that's actually my background uh, from the very beginning. We, uh, we are very fortunate to have a, have a very broad theory group here in Innsbruck. And I'm, excuse me, my theory friends, I'm, it's just one slide, yeah, basically on uh, what you guys are doing. I mean, it's amazing, yeah, what they have been looking at over the last years. In particular, they've been addressing this, this issue of a single particle transistor, yeah, how one could do toy models with these tricks that I uh, told you. Um, before, yeah, and, uh, uh, and many others that I think here in Innsbruck, the photonics group, the group at the Ion uh, Physics Institute, where there are in fact more connections than we think, yeah, in particular with respect to molecular systems and with respect to precision spectroscopy, with respect to molecular control. And uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, this institute here, as you know. Now, okay, that's to my team, yeah, and this is uh, how I think uh, one should consider this. And uh, I don't see any many very young students here, so I could have crossed out this one here. But I'm sure uh, we won't have problem with getting young people. So let me fi finish in saying uh, thank you to uh, my team uh, that has been very uh, productive over the last years. I should, will not talk, uh, talk about everybody now in view of time, but I just want to mention uh, Johan Danzel, Elmar Haller, Manfred Mark, uh, Katharina Lauber uh, joined about one and a half years before. We've had a tremendous support from theory here in Innsbruck, and uh, these two guys uh, actually moved away from Innsbruck by now, assuming positions somewhere else. Uh, we have had uh, tremendous support from various other groups uh, all over the world uh, for this experiment that we call cesium 3 for this project. Now, I um, should mention that much of this work has been done in collaboration uh, with Rudi Grimm, who uh, pushed all this, and in fact, he had many of the uh, 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 very sem uh, seminal ideas on these systems, very long, in the 90s already. So uh, I'm very fortunate to work together with Rudy and also with Francesca and with these two teams, the rubidium cesium team, on which where we do what we have just told you, these uh, uh, molecule systems, and uh, a, system, uh, a team where I've not talked about the physics they investigate, they are more interested in the few body aspect of, of these systems, yeah, three particles, four particles at a time. Um, and the last but not least, I should uh, um, certainly uh, say thank you to um, the tremendous support we've had and uh, we'll keep up the good work. Uh, certainly within the framework of all the other groups here, I uh, should mention we have had, had uh, awesome support from our secretaries, from our workshops, uh, and uh, well, last but not least, my family. <laughs> Yeah, who have to put up with me leaving again, uh, 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 being gone the next weekend. And uh, after your questions, let's uh, toast, okay?